Welcome to another segment of Politics Done Right. Today I have the honor of speaking to Daniel J. Cohen. Daniel is a Houston activist and the president of Indivisible Houston. Daniel, welcome aboard once again. You are one of our regulars. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing good. You know, all things considered, uh, I'm a fortunate person. How are you doing? I am doing fine. I mean, one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on is you wrote a hell of an article for Medium, of course, uh, which I went ahead and reprinted at EgbertoWillis.com about the reopening of the government, the responsibility and all that sort of thing. I want to first show folks uh, the article. You guys need to just get online and go to either Medium or EgbertoWillis.com and look for that article titled, We Can't Just Turn the Economy Back On. We Must Adapt. A very insightful article article by Daniel. Daniel, why don't you tell me a little bit about your thoughts of what's going on right now with this stuff about reopening the government and all of that? I think there's a, a bipartisan failure, actually, in terms of discussing this. And I think that it's intentional on one side, and I think the other side's getting duped. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what an economy is. An economy is when you have trade. Um, in modern terms, it's usually tethered in some sense to a currency, right? So right. if you resource supply, there's a demand, I trade uh, a resource for currency or vice versa, that's what an economy is. And they're really, it's not that much more complicated than that in terms of a baseline of what an economy is. So when we say the economy needs to be turned back on, I say to myself, well, I don't think that the economy ever got turned off. You can't really turn an economy off like right. with a it's not like you pull a ripcord and the thing either moves or it doesn't move. It's not a lawnmower. It's, you know, it's constant trade that's going on. So, you know, is the economy off? Well, I mean, there's still trade. You're still, you know, people, if you watch TV, if you've got a TV and you can turn on cable or whatever. Uh, so you can't really like turn the economy up back on like it's a lawnmower. It doesn't start with a ripcord. So I say, you know, is the economy off? Well, you can't really turn it off. So the answer is no. Um, if you, if it were off, like if you actually had no economic activity or anything like that, the way that that would work is a lot different than this. You wouldn't be, you know, people wouldn't be able to turn on their TV and see commercials or anything like that. There wouldn't be people who had deliveries of food to their house and stuff like that. You know, there'd be people who are trying to figure out, uh, like even a step below this, right. Would be people with wheelbarrows full of currency that was hyperinflated that they were like take it to a market 15 miles away or something like that. It, like we're not even where that is, right? So there's still stuff that's going on. What people are really saying is that a lot of people are out of work, that we have high unemployment, that we've had a lot of people's retirements take a hit because the market fell and you know, that, that things are bad, right? And that you know, they, generally speaking, the economy is not in good shape right now because we've had this event that has been largely um, mismanaged and partly leveled at us by nature or whatever. So. What, what all of these politicians are doing right now is falling in line with what the White House wants us to say, which is, hey, the economy's off, we gotta turn it back on, which is a code word for end social distancing so that people can go back into movie theaters and things like that. That's really what they're talking about when they say reopen the economy, is like allowing people to come back together uh, physically, which of course we know is really, really bad when it comes to, to the COVID issue. Um, and it's a shame that a lot of Democratic governors have picked up the same language, and so is the CDC, that everybody's talking about this like it's a light switch. They talk about open or reopen or it's turned off. We need to turn it back on or people need to go back. They talk about it like it's a binary. And it's very, very dangerous to do that. And that's, that's really, if I could stress that more than anything else throughout our conversation is, you know, when you hear somebody say, turn it back on, or it's turned off, or we need to get people back, like, stop thinking of it as a black or a white. We need to be adapting our economy in the meantime so that we can bridge where we are now to what it will be like as we come up with all of the medical adjustments that we need to come up with so that we can come out the other side of this. There was a survey with Chicago economists, or excuse me, it was a survey conducted um, uh, uh, by Booth in Chicago of economists from leading institutions around the United States. And 100% of them said, if you reopen businesses that should be closed too early, you get worse medical outcomes and you get worse economic outcomes. So you really can't sidestep this thing. There's nothing That's you can separate uh, the Not to economy. cut you right there, I want to interrupt for, for one reason. Japan has just found that out because Japan has come back worse 
than it was in the beginning. But here, here, here's the interesting thing, and I, I want us to get back on this subject, but you, uh, you opened the door for a very important statement. You said that uh, we are being played. Always seems that uh, when, it talk, when we talk about narrative, that the Democrats allow themselves to get played by the narrative. Can you explain why that is? I mean, we got played by throwing, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We got played by throwing grandma off the cliff. When we are the ones who had the... Na we always have the narrative of humanity. We always have the narrative that the policies that we want are what's good for human beings. How do we always allow them to turn it around? I think um, the best thing to do is reject the premise of the question, right? Instead of accepting the premise and trying to go toe to toe with what people are saying. And so, you know, how like we always get caught flat footed. If I were going to reject the premise of that question, right, then I would say, you know, there have been lots of, of, of progressive voices who have been able to get out in front of the hard right over time. And I think that, you know, when it comes to the question, uh, when are we going to reopen the economy? I think the answer should be, Look, the economy right now is rough um, because certain industries are closed, certain industries are shut down, certain businesses are not going well. We have to find adaptations for those businesses because otherwise what we're going to wind up with is a worse economy and we're going to wind up with more people sick and more people dead. And that's what the White House is trying to do. So, you know, there, there's this. I like this that. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I, would, I would preface the first part and say when they said uh, we need to reopen the economy, no, the economy never closed. It doesn't. No, it 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 doesn't close. I mean, it, it it's a, a closed down economy. I mean, really, if you think this is bad, I mean, things can get a heck of a lot worse. And a closed down economy is like worse than the Great Depression because it literally means that there's no trade whatsoever. If you've got no economy, then you have no order at that point, and then people aren't getting anything that they need. And by saying we need to reopen the economy, it's a double whammy, right? Because one, they get to uh, put people back into unsafe positions, right, thereby leading to the more sickness, more death and worse economic outcomes, um, you know, that they've been that that I mentioned before. And then two, they get to avoid the really hard conversation, which is how are we going to get people back to work in a safe way? How are we going to come up with programs that actually help uh, uh, businesses and people that are hurting right now get back to where they're going. How can we come up with a medical game plan that leads to widespread testing, that leads to therapy, that leads to a vaccine, um, you know, that, that, that actually takes on the problem that's in front of us? Like, those are the hard questions that leaders right now are not doing a great job at large of answering. Some are doing better than others, but at large, they're not doing a great job of addressing them all together. So we let them off the hook by asking an oversimplified question. Um, you know, which is like, when when are we going to turn it back on again? What do you mean by turning it back on? You're saying, when am I going to jam a stadium full of 60,000 people? You got a long time to wait for that. Right. So if you and if you directly answer that, then what you're going to get labeled with is they're going to call you a naysayer for saying that. So instead, you have to reject the premise of the question. You have to head it off at the past and that, at the past. And that's that's the way that the, you know, politically speaking, um, left voices can start addressing this BS talking point. Now, Daniel, what you're saying, while smart, should be quite evident. Um, is there some reason that you see why the left, you said caught flat-footed, why they always seem to be caught flat-footed? Why is that? I mean, we're, we have a lot of intelligence on our side. Well, I mean, there's a few things. One, I mean, getting people people who, you know, people on the right, when they take, when they go to college, they're ma they major in business and marketing and accounting and things like that and people on the left in college are majoring in sociology and there's nothing wrong with majoring in sociology but there's something about that when it comes to politics which is a lot of the majors that we lean into are the ones that focus on how you answer questions about the world and how you can get to the right answer and when you're in a major like that then you're going to talk in a more complicated way because the world is complicated and the challenges that you face are complicated whereas if you're in the realm of business, you're trying to figure out how to put your unique selling proposition in eight words so that you can sell whatever product or service it is that you're trying to move out the door. So there's something about the nature of it too and the nature of the field and the nature of sort of the, the skill sets that people are going into. I've long been a proponent of people on the left learning how to think in terms of power resource structuring, project management and you know kind of understanding um, how power resources move around because I think that they can do a little bit better. The other 
The other piece of that, though, is that, um, you, you know, we're, we don't we and so we don't speak in sound bites right like that's mm -hmm. that's that's the short version of it we don't really speak in sound bites we're trying to solve the problem and the problem doesn't get solved in sound bites because complicated questions require complicated answers and complicated answers are longer than an 8 second sound bite and that's the way that it is but you also have to realize the arena that you're in in a given moment and if you're inside of the political arena then you need to adjust yourself and kind of move it that way it, the strongest actual like left voice in terms of somebody m turning things into sound bites that are effective is Bernie Sanders. Um, I would love to see that sort of power resource thinking um, uh, uh, move to the rest of progressive voices, which includes a lot of people who are you know who are big Bernie Sanders supporters, um, to really kind of pick up where he left off and use that. And it's not just about language and communication; it's also about what strategy you take on. Um, I'm, I'm going to, you know, throw this, I'm going to kick the hornet's nest here because I realize I'm, I'm on politics done right. So I imagine somebody will take issue to this, but I'm going to say it, right? I work with, with third party and independent voters all the time, right? You want to mess around on, or you want, you know, you want to push, uh, on ice abolition and you want to work together on all this other stuff. There's lots of ways that we can collaborate and work together. The problem is a lot of the talking points surrounding a third party strategy for this year were used in the year 2000. I mean, these are completely outdated. The Green Party didn't have its stuff together as recently as four to six years ago. Their website, right. they, and so they, they, they're not thinking in terms of power resource management. They're just thinking about it like it, it strikes me as a art project or like they're out of touch with how power resources actually move. That's not an endorsement of the, the center. You know what I think about them. A lot right. of the policies they're pushing are really bad for working class people. Um, and so I, I don't support that either, but you have to show people a way forward in terms of strategy. So to tie it back to the original point, you know, why are people getting caught flat footed? Because they don't think about it in terms of a power game. They don't think about it in terms of, of, of fighting. They're thinking about it in terms of the world that they want to see. And while that is useful for answering the big questions, you've got to be able to, to, you know, change your feet and kind of shift modes depending on where you are. Absolutely. So, so then um, you just made an important thing. You, you want, you want to, in effect, you want to change the paradigm, the paradigm of discourse that we use right now. And in order to do that, we have to have a learning proposition. I know you've been actively working on that with the kind of people you bring into uh, Indivisible Houston. I know you've had trainings on how to uh, reach different population sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How can you grow that? How can we expand on that so that these terms like opening the economies, these terms as throwing mommy out with the bathwater, all these different things that they are very effective of doing, how do we do that in mass? I know in, independent media is one way. Coming on here and telling your story is one way, but there ought to be another way to actually train leaders uh, to become the Daniel Cohens, the Nisha Randalls of this world. I mean, I think that there are some good trainings out there that are working on some of that. Uh, I do think that we need to make them more accessible. Um, I think that there is room for us to take a little bit of a harder look in the mirror when it comes to where we miss on some of this stuff, right? Because we don't control, for example, if 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 somebody is going to um, not play fair, right? And they've got the keys, there's not a lot we can do other than point it out, call it out and kind of fight back against it. But we, we don't have the, we if we don't have the keys, then we're not able to actually adjust how the engine is running, right? So we have to, so what we can do though is work on our own stuff and work on the strategies that we're taking on. Um, and I think that it's it's back to I want to stop you organizing. Second. I need to stop you a second because you know you are a, a professional activist. You know all, all the works is. I think you need to explain to folks when you say uh, why we have to work from within our clique, if you will, because we don't have the keys. Explain what you mean by we don't have the keys. <laughs> That's a good point. Look at me. I'm, I'm talking abstract right now. I'm breaking my own rules. But look, we, what I'm saying is that, you know, we, we obviously could do a better job of selling left ideas to people. And that doesn't depend on whether or not, not entirely at least, on whether or not like corporate media shuts down a talking point or whether or not we're not being given a fair shake in our own hometown newspaper. If we do a bad job of selling our ideas, then that's on us, right? Like if we if we use the wrong pitch, that's on us. If we're pushing people away, that's on us. If we can't build coalitions because we're so angry about this 
one thing that we can't find a way to work over here with somebody on something else, that's kind of on us. So there, there are certain things we do have to take responsibility for. It's not a matter of pull yourself up by your bootstrap style responsibility, but it is a matter of making sure that you're continuously improving. Because if you're always saying, this person stopped me, this person kept me from doing this, it's it's always, it's always whatever entity you wanna pick, whatever it might be, it's Cuomo, it's a DNC, whatever it is, then you never take a moment to look internally and say, well, how can I do this better? How can I actually get the word out a little bit better to other people? The less that we spend focusing on the talking points of the opposition and of the, the, the people who have uh, goals that conflict with ours um, and, and buying it, then the less we're gonna be buying into their frames and buying into their limitations. So we need to, we definitely need to kind of look inward and think, okay, how can we do a little bit better? What kind of trainings can we set up? Where am I falling short in terms of reaching out to communities that I'm not necessarily connected to, particularly in a time when I can't physically go to another part of town very easily and certainly can't go and talk to people I've never talked to before or knock on their doors. We really have to kind of look inward on a lot of that stuff and figure out how we can be a little bit better about it because repeating the same song over and over again. I mean, if, if for the next seven months, we j the left spends you know, several hours a day like hammering away at the DNC without any forward momentum, we're going to have missed a huge opportunity to make progress. And the kind of opportunity to make progress that Bernie has been talking about throughout his entire run and that Elizabeth Warren has talked about for a lot of her run as well. Um, we, we can't just get caught in a loop when it comes to these conversations. We have to move to the next leg of the conversation, which is why we need to move from reopening the economy and that kind of talking point to adapt the economy, make it different, make it so that there, there are actual, there's forward momentum, there are forward solutions. Because if we get back into a back and forth where they're saying, you know, pack the stadiums and we're saying, don't reopen it, it's too early, then we're going to be caught in that same loop. I think just being conscious of these communication loops can go really, really far and think to yourself, what can I do to actually improve the way that I advocate or what I do on a regular basis? I love that. You know, I had a show, I think it's a two or three shows ago, where uh, that is pretty much what I've said, you know, and not, not what I've said. It's a, sort of a parallel thing where I said that uh, we need COVID-19 presents an opportunity for us because we are a lot of things we're going to be building from. I don't want to say building from scratch, but building to where it wasn't before. We have input into how this is going to be built. So therefore, let's create the map. Right now, we have a whole lot of lobbyists in town. They are trying to create it in the favor, in their face, in their favor, the way it's going to run for them. We have, a way, we have an opportunity now to push that out the way. And I love the way you said that. In other words, don't talk about it's too early to open the stadium. Talk about how are we going to open the stadium. Don't talk about, uh, well, uh, you know, that we can't afford this. Talk about why we need to afford this and why the money is there to afford all these different items. Don't talk yeah. about the, you know, and, and that's what I, I, those are the things that I'm trying to uh, put out lately. And that is, let's be the ones leading the conversation. You're, you do a great job, especially in healthcare, because I mean, I know that's your, that's, that's, that's my pet peeve, yeah. you know, it, but it's, it really is, it's a great example in terms of rejecting the premise of the question, right? Is that, you know, they say, how are you going to pay for it? You want to see how we're pay for, paying for it now? Why don't you turn on, you know, any news station and they'll tell you all day how we're paying for it. We basically put somebody into a, into a meat grinder. And then what comes out the other side of that is the economic outcome, right? right. Which is decide not to pay for their treatment. And so we get a dead person for it. But the, but at the end of the day, what, to even further reject the premise of the question, um, our healthcare system is more expensive because of the current model. The way that we would pay for it is by adjusting to a new model that allows for everybody to get care for less money overall because you have a single pool. So, you know, you want to know how we pay for it. We change away from this stupid system that gets nobody care for exorbitant fees. I mean, where we are right now is absolutely not a system that we should support. So we should move to a system that's going to cost less money. And they say, well, where are you going to come up with the money for that system? And you say, I don't know, maybe we should use some of the resources that we just wasted over here. It's going to cost less money. So right. you ask how you pay for it. I don't know. How do you afford something that costs less? You spend less money on it. It's not a complicated question, but what's even better about it is you get better health outcomes out of it. You have a more dignified system where people are actually able to live and you can recognize their humanity. You get better quality of life out of it. Nobody's digging for coupons online. Trish Robinson, 
the wonderful uh, Indivisible Liberty County organizer, uh, founder, you know, told us, said the other day that she asked, um, she said, hey, you know, I, I, this is a $900 prescription. I saw there was a coupon for it before. You know, do you think there's one available? And she said, they said, look, you know, the pharmacist is like, yeah, I don't know. Check the website. You might see another one. She looks on the website. There's a coupon for it. She uses a coupon. She gets it for free. If she had never asked the question, she would have paid nine hundred dollars. dollars Yes. So, you know, how how is Trish Robinson supposed to afford that? How is somebody who doesn't know where the coupon supposed to afford that? You want to ask me how we can afford it? How can anyone afford this brutal, you know, exorbitant? Inhumane. It's in it's entirely inhumane. So, yeah. The way you do it with healthcare is a great example of how you can kind of change the frame, but it's every single issue. I'll give you another one right now. We are currently seeing the biggest drop in carbon emissions. Oh, yes. In yeah. years, <laughs> years, right? We were seeing this enormous yeah, drop think, in yes. carbon emissions. And, and so, you know, people, how, well, how could, how could we afford that? I don't know. I don't know how we could ever do that. I, I guess if everybody stayed inside, technically, you know, the emissions would lower and then you'd be able to, <laughs> right? Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't be moving around again. I, I'd love to see people moving around again. And I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to, again, some someday if some people driving cars. But I think it does reframe a lot of the conversations about what we do on a regular basis. People want, you know, a boss wants somebody to come into an office. All right, so now we have the cost of carbon emissions, one. We've got their costs uh, coming and going, their time costs, so that's two. So now they're more tired, so they can't take care of their kids, that's three. So now their kids, of course, have struggles when it comes to, you know, that, that's more time taken away from them when it comes to being a family, to education, to solving the challenges that are in front of them, their quality of life at home. Um, they're going to be burned out. They're going to be less effective on their jobs. They're not going to be able to create the same economic output when they're at work in the first place. Not to mention everybody's got traffic jams. So they got extra stress because of that. Like there's so many different things that come out of this. And then you stack the emissions issue on top of it. If you want to take... It make advances when it comes to energy preservation and sustainability. Just, just take some of the lessons of what we're learning by looking outside. And that's what I mean by adapting the economy is that we're learning all of these things through an experiment that would be entirely inhumane to set up. But nature set but it up. did it for us. You know, yeah, you know what is interesting? What is interesting is I said on, on a couple shows or probably three shows ago that uh, there, you know, a lot of people want things to be the way they were before. Let's say we found a vaccine, and I can go. You know, I'm from I'm from a Latin Caribbean culture. We hug a lot, but we can't do that anymore. Okay, so let's say um, let's say that um, we come back. People say we want things to be the way before, and we have a vaccine now, so we can do. All. The thing about it, I think people are going to realize it, and I realize it myself. You know, is that a simpler life can be non-stressing it can be wonderful for your credit card bill it can be there are so many things that came out of seeing this and what and and a lot of companies are also going to notice hey these folks can work at home efficiently taking care of their kids and working in between those spare times maybe we can create a work schedule that looks like that there's so yeah. much that's coming out of this why i say Real estate companies are likely to lose a lot of money because a lot of companies are going to realize they could make more money even if their total amount of money is dropped. The, the, yeah. the reason that they don't have an electric bill and they don't have all these other bills makes it make sense to have a different modal. And I know Definitely. this could change a lot. It really, no, it really could. A lot of the companies, look, uh, this is not an endorsement of any of these companies, but just to look at their model, right? Like, Amazon starts, it starts as this book, this peer-to-peer -peer sale, right, company. And the, the idea was like, if I want to got a book that's, I want to sell it for seven bucks and, you know, you're in, I don't know, like uh, uh, Morocco, right? And, you know, you want the book, then I can sell it to you for seven bucks and they'll ship it over and it'll be affordable at the end of the day. And people go, that's crazy. You know, it's, what are you out of your mind? You'd never be able to get it for that cheap. That's a logistical issue. Logistical issues can be solved, right? If right. your biggest problem, issues, you can kind of figure them out because you figure out how to move things and then you make them cheaper because usually there was some glut that was built in. That's how you see ride share programs. That's how you see Airbnb. That's how you see some of the office share programs now that are out there, which are basically mm -hmm. up for, for offices. Of course, they're probably not doing well at the very moment because there right. aren't people having meetings face to face. But like, but the point is that people made a lot of money just saying, 
why why would we do it this way to begin with when when it, you know when th exactly. before exactly so i mean now there's definitely you know there's no reason for us to just like cling on to the world the way that it was before because well so people were already thinking of doing di things differently than they were doing before you know so they're they're thinking about overcoming these logistical challenges as before so now that that now that some of the things that we saw in front of us have been reduced or have been narrowed, right? Or the way we think about it has been shrunk a little bit. Maybe you don't go out and see live music, right? You don't go out to a bar and you order a beer and watch your favorite band, but instead you got a six pack at home and you, you know, you're, you're streaming or something like that. There's a guy named DJ Mel who's been like running living room sets and, you know, people are dancing in their living room and stuff like that. It's not going to be forever, but it's certainly a way that it's going to be adjusted for a while here. So we need to be thinking about, we should always be thinking proactively about how we can change things and make them better anyway. And this is an even more important time to do it. So instead of getting stuck in, in this old mindset that's a flawed mindset of like, well, how do we get back to there? We should be thinking, all right, well, where do we go from here? Where do we go forward? What's going to change? And what should that look like? Daniel, isn't that the definition of progress, the first part of progressive? Absolutely. Yeah. Thinking of a different way to do things and moving forward and finding progress. It's always best if you can find if you can find a way to combine the timeless concepts with the new ideas and how to implement them, then you get the best That's possible. It. That's it. I like the way you said that. The timeless with moving forward because there are, in fact, things that are timeless and moving forward. Daniel J. Cohen, Houston, premier Houston activist and president of Indivisible Houston. It's been my pleasure to have you on Politics Done Right once again, sir. Uh, I think uh, it, it, it's an honor to have young people like yourselves doing the kind of work that needs to get done to move us forward, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be on your show, man, and thank you for being a member of the Free and Independent Press. I always thank you for that, and I always appreciate it, Egberto. Thank you very much, Daniel. I'm Egberto Willis, host of Politics Done Right, an independent news program. I post several news videos of interest every day. I ask you so kindly to subscribe to my channel, and please leave me some comments. Thank you very much.